Welcome to our discussion. I saw a lot of you enjoying the music like I was. I was trying not to dance and embarrass myself, but then I saw some of you guys going, so I hope you guys enjoyed that music as well. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Christine Van Campen. I'm the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at CHD Healthcare, and I'm honored to be moderating today's discussion. Um, you know, a lot of you guys know we've been focusing on inclusion and respect as part of our kind of cultural belief system for a very, very long time at CHG, almost two decades. And I'm so thrilled that we're launching and, and really making great progress on our new diversity, equity, and inclusion program, which is really a continuation of that commitment um, to focus on bridging differences and creating deeper connections in the workplace. Uh, and this discussion series was really developed to create a forum for people across the company to come together, learn from each other, and appreciate the diversity that's represented in our company. Um, we have three goals for today's session. The first is to provide education about some of the unique challenges our LGBTQ plus colleagues face. Um, second is to kind of understand how have our panelists navigated through their various experiences in life. And then third is to really increase our awareness um, of how we can continue to support our LGBTQ plus colleagues and community members. Um, one quick housekeeping note, we um, are gonna keep everybody muted. We wanna kind of avoid any distractions through the discussions, but we did solicit questions in advance. And so thank you for everyone that um, submitted those questions. We will be addressing those in today's session. So if we do not get to all of your questions or you didn't have a chance to submit those, just email them in to dei at chghealthcare.com and we will make sure we get a response to you. So with that out of the way, um, let's get started. So I am so excited to introduce you to our wonderful panel today. Uh, first, we have Amy Williams. Um, Amy is a senior um, accounts receivable specialist at CHG Healthcare. Um, Amy, wave and say hello to everybody for us. Hi, guys. <laughs> yeah, we're already getting the Wahoo Amy's in the chat. So, Amy, thank you so much for being willing to participate on our panel today. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Um, next, we have Bradley Johnson. So, Brad is a recruiter at RN Network. Brad, unmute and say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thanks for being here with us, Brad. We're excited to hear from you. Um, next, we have the one and only Eddie Rodriguez, Senior Corporate Event Specialist for CHG Healthcare. Eddie, say hi to everybody. What's up, CHG? <laughs> That's Eddie. Nice to have you with us. Um, and last but not least, we have Steph Howe. Steph is a Hospital Privilege Coordinator with Compelled Locum Tenants. Steph, say hi to everybody. Hi everyone, happy to be here. So happy to have you, Steph. And panelists again, I just have to thank you so much um, for your willingness to tell your story, you know, let your colleagues get to know you a little bit more and, and to just really participate in our diversity, equity and inclusion efforts. We're very, very grateful for your participation today. Um, and that's really kind of where I want to get started is getting to know you each a little bit better. So um, I want to start by having each of you just tell us a little bit about yourselves. Kind of where did you grow up? What, what are you interested? Just talk to us a little bit about who you are. Um, Eddie, can I talk, start with you first? Definitely. Uh, so I am Eddie Rodriguez. Uh, I am a native New Yorker, born and raised in lower Manhattan. Uh, you'll hear my accent once in a while come out, um, you know, as I drink my coffee and water. <laughs> um, I moved to Florida in 2005 and found Weatherby in 2007, and I have been here ever since. Uh, my journey did start at Weatherby, um, and just uh, almost three years now I've been with the CHG division and stuff, but um, born and raised Weatherby and stuff. So, you know, they'll always have my back and That's love right. them. Awesome. Thanks, Eddie. And by the way, um, Eddie still bleeds Weatherby red for those Weatherby <laughs> folks on, on the call. I just got to say that. So Eddie, I've had a chance to work with Eddie. He's amazing. So, so happy to have you today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I have you go next, Amy? Introduce yourself. Absolutely. I am Amy. 
I started with CHG uh, back in 2011. This year is my 10 year. Next week, actually. Very excited. Um, I grew up mostly in Utah. There was a short stint in Montana during grade school. I still consider that home, oddly enough. <laughs> um, in the very backwoods, went to a tiny one-room schoolhouse um, with 19 total students in the whole school. Um, came back to Utah and finished high school, and I, I love it here almost as much. Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, Bradley, would you mind going next? Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Bradley Johnson. So I grew up in rural Wisconsin, Southeast Wisconsin, Southwest of um, Milwaukee, very rural area, very conservative. Um, and as I was kind of growing up, I just to kind of tell you a little bit about who I am. Like I always thought I would be just a normal person getting married growing up because that was kind of the norm. And um, it wasn't until I met my first partner when I was 19 that I really realized that like, wow, okay, I, you know, I'm, um, gay and you know it's okay to be gay and have a life outside of um, thinking what people think is normal um, and anyway a long story short is I ended up moving down here to Florida in about 2005 and I joined CHG in 2015 um, I was on the talent acquisition team and um, transitioned over to our network in September and have been there ever since Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Bradley. And I've had the chance to work with Bradley as well. And he's also just amazing. So thanks for being on our panel today. You're welcome. And again, last but not least, Steph, um, please introduce yourself to everybody. Yeah, um, I'm Stephanie or Steph. I was pretty much born and raised in the Salt Lake Valley. I graduated from Jordan High School back in a while ago. And uh, I went to college at the University of Utah, got my degree in English because I'm socially awkward. Um, I do have two kids. We've got a six-year-old boy and an almost four-year-old girl, and they take up practically all of my time, which I guess is okay because I do love them quite a bit, but I co-parent my kids with their biological mom, who happens to be my best friend, and I think we make a pretty great family. Uh, we really like spending time together. We've got season tickets to Lagoon, so come up and hang out with us this summer. Uh, as far as interests go, I really like dogs. I like reading and learning new things about pretty much anything. Um, I like going on runs. I'm always interested in recommendations for TV shows and movies, although I almost never have time to watch anything. So that's kind of where I'm at in life right now. Uh, but I've been with CHG for about a year and a half. I work with the lovely people in hospital privileging over at Comp Health Locum Times, and they genuinely are some of the best people I've ever known. And I'm on the panel today because I am a proud transgender woman. And I'm just so honored to have the opportunity to share my thoughts and my experiences today. Oh, Steph, thank you so much for being here with us. We're so, so happy that you joined our company and it sounds like you found a home and we're thrilled to have you. So thanks for bringing your voice into the conversation. Um, so as you guys can see, we've assembled a really great panel for our conversation today. and. You know, the introductions are interesting because they kind of illustrate that you've each had a very different journey <laughs> in life, right? I mean, you, you've taken different paths in different generations. Um, so we'd like to kind of start there, you know, um, you know, would you mind telling us a little bit about your journey and, and what your experience has been? Um, and Amy, I'd actually like to start with you if you don't mind. Not at all. I, uh, I was a very late bloomer. I, um, you know, growing up had done everything that I thought I was supposed to have done. I had children, I was married, you know, bought the home, made a career, did all of those things. Um, and in my thirties started to realize there was something missing. I wasn't unhappy, but I knew that I could be happier. And, um, it was a difficult transition, especially for, for my ex-husband, of course, but um, he, he ended up supporting me and being kind about it as much as it hurt him. Um, my children are my biggest fans 
and mm-hmm. my greatest supporters and always have been. Um, they are my whole life, my grandchildren as well. And I think the, the most important thing for me, I've always been very open and very out. I wasn't ever in a place that, that I felt unsafe to be out. Um, my family was very, very supportive. I didn't have anyone that turned me away or told me that I was unacceptable in their eyes. Um, so my goal since then has been to try to include my LGBTQ plus family that don't have that opportunity. I want to be their family and I want to be the one that tells them you are okay and it's okay to be who you are no matter what that is. Um, that's, that's been the biggest thing that I learned. The hardest thing being as old as I was when I came out of my thirties was finding a community. And I hope to be that community and like to reach out to make sure that people know that, that they have that. Well, that's beautiful, Amy. <laughs> and we're, we're thrilled you're doing that. I mean, that's, that's how you build the bigger community, right? That's, it is. Well, how many kids do you have? I have two biological children mm-hmm. and one of my four stepchildren from my marriage um, is still in contact with me. Wow. So I have three, they're actually three daughters and I have two grandsons and four granddaughters. Well, and it sounds like- No, I had that backwards. I'm sorry. (laughs) Four grandsons, two granddaughters. (laughs) Well, and it sounds like countless of adopted children as well. Yes. It sounds like you're, you're, you're extending it well beyond your immediate family. So yes, thank you. That, that sounds, um, that sounds like an incredible journey. And I can't imagine thinking through at that stage of life, having to kind of go into that discussion with your now ex. Yes. Um, It must have taken a lot of courage and a lot of fortitude. So admire you and that's inspirational. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Um, Bradley, so I want to kind of compare and contrast. I mean, listening to Amy, it sounds like she had a lot of kind of support and, you know, maybe you had a, a bit of a different journey. Um, you touched on it a bit in your introduction. Can you tell us a little bit more about what, what that was like for you growing up? And you're on mute, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so it was very challenging for me growing up because I always knew there was something like kind of Amy said, like different or missing um, from what I was looking for. I mean, I had the girlfriend, I, you know, um, had I not truly met my first partner when I was 19 years old, I probably would have um, led a different life. Um mm-hmm. You know, he was a little bit older than me and kind of had been around and had support in the community, um, which uniquely enough, um, as I was growing up in that community, it was very closeted um, at that time. And this is in the in the early late 80s, early 90s. Um, It still wasn't um, really acceptable, if you will, to to be yourself and be um, open about it. Um, so I was very, very reserved about it. I didn't come out to my family until probably, geez, um, probably the late 90s. So I, I kept it um, down low for quite a while. Um, and basically, again, it's just because, you know, you didn't know what to expect. Like, what was your family think? What would your friends think? Um, there's times I'm still uncomfortable with it. Um, only from the standpoint is you just don't know how that other person may or may not react. Um, uh, fortunately for me that ha- have meeting my first partner at, at such a young age has kind of helped me be in the community. Um, you know, the community as it was known back then was usually going out to bars. Uh, matter of fact, the, the bar that I would go to actually wasn't even open. It was like a closed club and they called it the Monday night dance club to keep it down low. Um, so you can kind of s- sense that like it was not the, the easiest way of life. Um, I wouldn't say, I would say probably when I moved down here, it became a little bit more open and accepting because there is such a large community here. Um, 
about a year after I moved down here, I joined um, a gay men's chorus, which of course opened up a lot more to the, to my eyes, to the community in itself. Um, our chorus is an absolute amazing organization. Um, look it up if you don't uh, have never heard of it or heard me talk about it. It's the Gay Men's Chorus of South Florida. Um, we inspire um, by opening minds on hearts and minds of people. Um, that's our um, thing. So I've, it's interesting that I was able to um, come on board with CHD because there's a lot of alignment there between the two um, organizations. Um, so I do love to sing and perform. Um, my team absolutely loves, you know, we, we go back and forth on that at times. Um, so that's a lot of fun. Um, I'm a huge sports fan. Um, I really follow the, um, the, the, the Wisconsin teams, Packer fan, Bucks fan, Brewers fan. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's, I, I really um, have been able to, especially here at CHG, right? I mean, when I first, whenever you first start a job, you just don't know what to expect. Like, are people going to be open and accepting or not? What, where is it? So you kind of have to feel that out. Um, and I was able to, you know, connect with some of the people here that are in the community and, and feel more comfortable. And as I got more comfortable with them, got more comfortable with my team and so forth. So um, I've been very fortunate to have had a lot of support around me through the years and feel more comfortable now than ever before. Hmm. What, a, what a journey you've been on. And, you know, I think what I'm most happy about is your last statement. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy for you. And that's what we're really striving for here is just greater acceptance and connection and understanding and empathy. So that's a, an amazing journey. What, what did it feel like to have to be closeted for such a long period of time? What, what effect did that have on you? So it definitely affects your psyche, right? Because you want people to, to know because it's who you are. Um, so you ju it just it really does play on your psych. I mean, um, at times I I mean, in my younger days, I look back now and think, wow, you know, I did have some of those horrible thoughts like I'm different. What's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it just it plays you know, back and forth at times on you because it's like you want so much to be accepted and like having found that has made just it just makes you feel so much more um cared about and loved and, and appreciated and accepted oh, that's great yeah i can't i can't imagine what that must have been like but i'm glad you found a home as well <laughs> that's, thank that's you great. yeah yeah uh, so steph i want to move to you next you know i'm not we're, this isn't a generational panel but we did talk about this in our planning you know LGBTQ plus acceptance um, is relatively recent in our society. So there's a range of experiences based on when you came out and, and where you are in your life's journey. Um, Steph, as the younger member of our panel, I'd love to kind of hear from you, your journey um, and, and what brought you to where you are today. We'll try to do this without crying um, and I'll probably fail a little bit, but I didn't grow up knowing that I was transgender. I just grew up slowly learning that there was just something different about me. Um, when I was young, I liked to get together with the other kids from the neighborhood and play house. And anytime we got together, I was really excited to be the mom. So when other kids told me that boys don't get to be moms, that just felt so unfair to me. And it made me really sad, even though I didn't fully understand why. Um, but growing up, I always felt more comfortable around other girls. I was drawn to the things they were interested in. I wanted to do what they were doing. At home, I even tried to dress like them. So when I was about eight, I had my mom enroll me in gymnastics. And I was in a class of about six or seven other girls. And it was just my absolute favorite thing. I loved it so much. And at school, during recess, the boys would go outside and they would go play football. And the girls would go outside and do dance and tumbling. And I always went with the girls and I never thought that that was weird or unusual. That's just who I was and what I wanted to do. But it didn't take long before other kids started to bully me for being different. So I had other boys come up to me and they would say things like, why are you always with the girls? Do you wanna be a girl? Oh, you're such a girl, aren't you? And then they would laugh at me. And honestly, it was just so confusing to me because I didn't understand what I was doing wrong, mm -hmm. but I was a kid and like most kids, 
I just wanted to be liked and I wanted to fit in. And I knew for sure that I didn't want to be made fun of because that hurt. So I went home and I asked my mom to take me out of gymnastics, even though I loved it so much. And when I, when I came back to school during recess, I went outside and I forced myself to go play football with the boys. And that's kind of what my childhood was like. I had, I had a lot of experiences like that. And I learned a really bad, but really important lesson, which was, it's not okay to be who you are. You have to be who other people want you to be. And sadly, I lived my life the next two decades that way. Um, you know, getting my sense of value and self-worth from my ability to satisfy the expectations of what other people wanted me to do or who they wanted me to be. And because of the faith that I grew up with that had certain views on gay and transgender lifestyles, I never considered the possibility that I could be the way that I am. So the only conclusion I could draw was that there's just something wrong with me. Deep inside me, there was something broken that I needed to fix. And so I tried to do that. Or at the very least, I just pretended that it wasn't there at all. But I think as anybody in the LGBTQ plus community would tell you, you can only do that for so long because living a life that isn't true to who you are, it wears you down. It slowly eats away at you until you inevitably reach this breaking point. So by the time I became an adult, I was dealing with severe anxiety and depression, even suicidal ideation. And I really hate to say this, but I'd gotten married, I'd had kids and started a family, and there were still times where I just wanted to be dead because it was so, it was so hard dealing with all of that um, and denying who I was. So about two or three years ago, I reached that breaking point. I was lying in a hospital bed in the emergency room at LDS Hospital. I'd had a very scary experience relating to this gender identity situation. And my spouse came down to meet me. She brought our daughter with her. And I'm lying on the hospital bed with my daughter on my chest, just my arms wrapped around her. And I'm forced into this sobering realization that I can't do this anymore. I can't keep living my life this way. Because if I do, I'm not going to have a future. And that was such a hard reality to accept. And it took so much, it took so much courage to take the next steps forward, which included coming out and starting my gender transition. But with the incredible love and support of my family, I did that. And happily, I can now say that transitioning has not only saved my life, but I genuinely feel happier than I've ever been in my entire life. And I'm so glad to be here. So that's my story. Wow. Wow, Steph. That's powerful. That was powerful. And you were worried about you crying. I'm just gonna say I saw I saw a few <laughs> saw a few tears in the audience. That's an incredible story. Um, we're so happy for you. We're so happy you're here, Stephanie. Uh, thank you very thank much you. for that. Oh, all right, Eddie. Let's let's move over to you. Talk a little bit about um, what your journey has been like. Well, Steph, like proud of you and thank you for sharing because that is not easy to follow. So <laughs> I'm like still catching my breath. <laughs> yeah. um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, everyone, I am from New York. So I was raised with diversity. I was raised in a city of just kind of craziness. Uh, everyone was welcomed and I was unlike some people, I was lucky to have a family that was accepting. I have a gay uncle, I have seven gay cousins uh, throughout my family. So I, I had it a little easier than most people. Um, I had a family that was supportive, accepting, um, and were there for, for me. Um, and like I said, I think the hardest thing I had to come to was just being honest with myself and being able to have that conversation with my family, you know, so. Um, what I love that I was able to do growing up was my mom said, try everything, try it once. You don't know if you don't try and stuff. And like that 
helped me just kind of find who I was and who I am today. Um, so just, I was, like I said, my story is a little different. Like I had it a lot easier than some. Um, and, but I'm also there to show that like, it's not always a hard struggle, yeah. but we do look for that support and that, um, that it's okay. And affirm it's, you know, being affirmed from your parents, especially. So I came out when I was 17. Uh, to my mom first, uh, two days later to my dad, <laughs> and uh, both of them kind of said, we know, we're okay, and stuff, y you be safe, you know. Um, I think my struggle, though, honestly, was I had a brother who was one year younger. We had the same friend who grew up together. We, you know, it's like we hung out with the same group, like, how do I share that with my brother? How do I share that with our friends and stuff? Like, when's the right time? Mm -hmm. um I will say it wasn't easy because the same thing like when you're gonna get a girlfriend when you're gonna do this when you're gonna do this? I was like not <laughs> like you know um so I will say I had the conversation with my brother and um I, I'm just so proud of him because he was like well, when we're going out then that's what he <laughs> said to me and I was like yeah <laughs> Like, wow, you know, like, I didn't expect that I was ready for the worst, you know, like just preparing and he didn't care. He didn't care. He loved me. And same thing with my parents, they didn't care. They loved me. And so, so I know my story is a little different, but I will say it's because of that love that I'm here today to kind of, you know, show that not every family, you know, how do we say this? Not every family is going to fight you to change you. Um, some families are there to be supportive and are our allies. And I will say my best friend, my mom took in for three months because his family didn't accept him. Mm. Um, so like that was one of the best summers of my life. <laughs> mm. I will say where well, you have your best friend with you and you could support them through their challenge and stuff. And my mom was there for, her, for them. So, you know, that's kind of my story. I uh, moved to Florida though. And I felt like I had to start all over again. Stuff. I moved to Florida, my partner, uh, didn't know anybody. And so like that started the cycle again. It's like, who do I tell? Like, who can I share with? Um, so I didn't have that family support with me mm -hmm. right here. Um, so I will say that when I did find kind of CHG and Weatherby, like I was able to really be myself and stuff. And like I said, that journey was not a hard one and stuff and grateful for that. Oh, thank you, Eddie. And we're grateful you're here. And yeah, you got a CHG family. All of you have a CHG family that loves and supports you. Um, and as you, you can see, I mean, very different journeys. And two of our panelists had acceptance for the most part and two didn't. And man, those are tough, tough journeys. So thank you each so much for your vulnerability and your willingness to tell your story in such a public way. Um, very, very impactful. And that's why we're here is to expand people's understanding of your challenges. Um, so you've each shared with us your journey. I mean, I'd like to ask each of you just as you reflected on your journey in preparation for this panel, um, what do you most want people to understand? What, what would you like people to understand about your community and your journey? Stephanie, can I start with you? Yeah, of course. Um, so I was at Target the other day with my two kids, just shopping for groceries, and we needed to go to the bathroom. So I took my kids and we went over to the women's restroom. And we walk in into the stall, I locked the door behind us. And while I'm there, I was reminded of the fact that currently there are politicians and media personalities with huge platforms that argue that people like me identify as transgender so we can gain access to these bathrooms and sexually assault other people. I'm just a mom in the bathroom with my kids trying to live my life. I'm not trying to harm anybody. And I guess that's what I would want people to understand that people like me, whether, whether gay, bi, trans or something else, we're just trying to live our lives in peace. We just want to exist and have normal lives. That's it. We don't have an agenda. We're not trying to ruin anybody's day. We just want to exist. But the problem is 
we can't live and exist in peace while people are constantly questioning and challenging our rights. We can't have fulfilling and meaningful lives while laws intended to erase us from society are still being enacted today. I can't feel safe while I see trans people, specifically trans women of color, being the targets of harassment, physical violence, and murder. So for me, that's what pride is. It's, you know, growing up being told that you're gross, you're disgusting, you're not welcome here, you should go kill yourself. Coming through that and still loving me for the person I am, pride is about insisting on my right to exist fully and equally in this world. But we can't have that unless we get everybody's help. So that's what I would want people to know. Oh, that's a powerful message, Stephanie. Thank you very, very much. And I think you're setting a trend here. Nobody's going to want to follow you. So, uh, <laughs> so panelists, um, who would like to follow Steph? <laughs> I, I'll just, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Eddie. All right. I just want to share. I think one thing people have to remember, like so many of us have the same interests. Like we have families and stuff. We enjoy sports. Like, you know, give me an ice cold beer. Like we're human. Like we are people. And like, th there's nothing that kind of changes that aspect. Like we still know how to have a good time and we still know how to cry and we still have emotions. And I was like, those are the things that people need to remember regardless of our sexual preferences and this, that and the other doesn't matter. And like, people need to realize that like, I'm not out to get you yeah. and stuff. Like, that's not my role. That's not my job and stuff. Like, if you know me, like my job is to make you laugh and make you smile and make you happy and enjoy life and stuff. So I think sometimes people just need to remember, like we are human, just like you are. That's and stuff. Right. We, we bleed just like you do. We feel just like you do. And we care just like you do. That's right. Very, very well said, Eddie. Yeah, very well said. And by the way, you always exceed expectations on making us happy and and laugh. So thank you for thank you for the joy that you bring into all of our lives. And that's a really powerful message as well. Yeah, thank you, um, Bradley. Let's go to you next. Yeah, just I mean, uh, obviously, you know, very similar to what they're saying. Like, just I'm no different than my friends or family members, other than I have a different lifestyle doesn't make me a bad person doesn't make me any different than anybody else um you know that the, that's the like Steph said the issue I think that we want people to understand is you know you don't need to stereotype yes there are stereotypes but you don't need to use those stereotypes against each other I mean there's no reason to do that um you know I, I look at it like I said, kind of in my story, like how things were as I was growing up and how things are today, there still are those stereotypes out there. I can give you an example. I was standing out at the Dairy Queen in Wilton Manors a few months back and a, um, you know, a truck went by and they, you know, yelled out a derogative, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, you know, why is that necessary? Does it make the, that person feel better because they're bullying or feel like they're bullying other people? So um, it, it just kind of goes along with what both Eddie and, and Steph said. It's, it, we're no different than you, and there's no reason for people to have this type of hate and, um, and, and, stereo and stereotype people because it's just not necessary. Couldn't agree more. I think we're all feeling... We're all ready to get back to a little more civility and love and kindness in the world. So um, thank you for sharing that, Bradley. Amy, what, what do you want people to understand about your journey? I think, um, like I touched on earlier, I think it's important that those that are scared to come out know that, that our community is here for you, that you are can be safe with us and if you're not in a safe place to come out with your family you still have community mm -hmm. and especially here at CHG um, being uh, with CHG for as long as I have um, I was actually part of the group that started the very first employee network group which was the pride group 
um, my a couple of my friends that were also in my department um, were a part of that as well. And Mike Weinholz, um, miss him so much, <laughs> um, really supported and wanted us to do this and pushed really hard for us to have this community and be open so that people were comfortable being in this company and being who they are. Um, and, and, you know, the, the whole saying that we use now of, you know, free to be me at CHG, that embodies our company. And I hope that people that are scared in CHG know now that they can be themselves with our groups. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, very well said. I, I have to say free to be me at CHG was what hooked me. I'm I, <laughs> that spoke to my heart and and that's why I'm still here and that's why we're having these conversations, right? This is who we are as a company, it's who we're committed to being as a company and it's for these reasons. This is why this is why we are are doing the things we're doing so yes thank you all so much so so far we've kind of heard from each of you about your upbringing kind of your journey what you want people to know um, i want to move into the questions we received from the audience we got some really really good questions submitted um so i want to start with the first one um and this this question was submitted it says it appears that fear prevents lgbtq plus employees from bringing their full selves to work these employees report they feel exhausted from spending time and energy concealing their authentic selves. I would like to know if CHG has a LGBTQ plus inclusive work environment. If yes, please describe what is working or where we need to improve. Um, anybody wanna take this one for me? I'd be happy to. Um, Thanks, our, our CHG uh, Pride group has gone through its ups and downs. Um, we had huge participation in the very beginning. It kind of tapered off for a while. Um, I feel like it's picking back up again in the last little while, which makes me so happy. I would love to see far more people involved and we want everyone, not just the LGBTQ, plus community we want allies we want people that want to get involved and want to um, help with our our efforts to spread education and to have activities that that we can do to um, get our word out there to the community we did many activities uh, over the years that that helped the homeless lgbtq youth um homeless families we've done so much in this group and there's still so much more to do and i would love to see as many people sign up for this group as we can get there's so much more work to do there's activism there's you know getting families involved in pride it's not just you it's your entire family bring your children help them see that we are all the same yeah. and that we can help each other no matter what our orientation or our you know sexual gender identification anything it doesn't matter we all need to be family oh, that's excellent advice thank you so much amy and i think i you know we kind of heard from each of you that i'm really grateful to hear that you you're feeling welcomed and supported at chg um, but we recognize there are probably people out there that don't necessarily feel that today. And that's why we're doing this work. So thank you for bringing that perspective forward, Amy. Um, let's move to the next audience question. So this question is, what can we do as friends or family members to let others know we care about them and their happiness, even if we may not completely understand what they are going through or be in agreement with their lifestyle choices? Um, Bradley, I'd love you to take this one, please. Yeah, thanks. So um, a couple different things to think about here, and I kind of uh, talked a little bit about this, right? Um, I, you know, thinking about um, what we're, what people need to understand is we are just people. Like we said, you know, we're no different than others around us that have what you would consider a, you know, 
a typical normal lifestyle, right? Um, I want to kind of um, hone in on part of the question that talks about a lifestyle choice, right? So think about it, right? I, if I had my choice, as I was telling my story, I would have gone a much different route. However, because of my um, inner personality person and who I am, you know, I am a different, I have a different lifestyle. And it doesn't mean that it's a choice because trust me, if we had a choice, um, I would say because of the, the way we are perceived and you, from all the different stories you've heard, um, you know, most people would choose to, to lead a, a different lifestyle. So I think um, main thing is, is just for people to understand that, um, you know, we're just, we're human people and like, we wanna just be supported, cared about, loved, and, um, you know, feel like we're all inclusive. Yeah. That's a really great, um, really great point, Brad. I, you brought that up in our, our planning session and it makes sense. Why would you choose a, a life of a pain and challenge and, and grief? So I think that's an important uh, distinction you brought out from the question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, our next question is, what are some of the signs we should look for in our own children or other family members to know if this is something they may be struggling with, which is a really important question. And um, Stephanie, I would be grateful if you would take this one for us. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a really great question. And I wish, I wish there was an easy way to look at our loved ones and say, if you do this, it probably means that. Um, but the reality is a lot of those signs can be very subjective and varied. And a lot of the times it's just not totally reliable. Um, what I do think is really important to understand is that statistically, we know that almost 80% of LGBTQ plus kids who are not yet out to their parents hear um, negative or discriminating comments about that community from their family and in their own homes. So that means these are kids growing up in an environment where they understand that it's not safe or okay for them to be the way that they are at home. So I would actually encourage kind of like flipping that question around. Instead of looking for signs in our kids or in our family members, I think we should look at ourselves and ask, what kind of signs am I sending to them so that they know this is gonna be a home where they will always feel welcomed, loved, and accepted no matter what. And as somebody who is a parent, I would be devastated if I ever got to a point where I felt like my own children felt like they couldn't come to me and ask me questions about how they're feeling or navigating their own identity. And I think we all feel that way about the people that we love. We wanna be safe places for them. And so I think that's the most important thing we can do for our family is just create an environment where everybody's loved, everybody's celebrated for who they are. And I think that will make such a bigger impact than trying to discern what this kind of behavior may mean or what it may not mean. Mm. No, that, that's, uh, that's profound, Stephanie. That's a really great way, like you said, to kind of flip the paradigm and all of us being much, much more aware of what we're saying and any any sort of signals we, we could be giving. So that, I think that's a really powerful way to kind of turn it back on what can you do instead of watching for something. That's, that's powerful. Um, excellent, thank you so much, Stephanie. You're welcome. Um, next question is, if you work with someone and you heard they are gay, but after five months they don't share, um, what is the best approach to communicate with them that you support them or should you just let it go? Um, Eddie, I'd love to start with you and kind of how would you address that question? Uh, so this is like water cooler talk. <laughs> Listen, I, I want to be honest, like it's not our job to out anybody or, or really like one that's hurtful, just so you guys know. It's um, we have our own kind of timeline of when we feel things work and when we feel it's okay and stuff. Um, but you do want to be supportive, especially, listen, this core group right now that are speaking to you all are supporters and stuff, are people you could talk to and reach out to if you have questions. But honestly, if 
you hear about it and I mean, people, listen, people talk shit all the time. <laughs> you know, like I want to put that out there. I was like, it doesn't matter and stuff. But if you want to be a true supporter and like invite that person out with some other people to lunch, like, hey, me and my team are going to lunch. You want to join us? Become their friend. You know what I'm saying? Like let them feel comfortable enough to have that conversation and stuff. And I know myself, I'll be the first one to say like in front of a group so that other people could hear like, oh my God, me and my partner had an amazing dinner at this place. You guys should check it out and stuff. So I'm drawing the attention to like, yes, I am out. I'm probably gay and stuff. And I have a partner and stuff that kind of keys into the like, oh, you know, like the light bulb goes off, like, oh, maybe I could talk to them or, okay, everyone knows that person. Maybe it is okay and stuff. So like put those examples out there. Uh, but like I said, do not go around and continue that story if you heard it and stuff. That's not what it's about. And that's not what our community is about. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Eddie. Thank you so much. Uh, Amy, anything you would add to that? Um, I think just like Eddie was saying, it's never, ever anyone else's place to out someone, ever. It's not okay to do that. Um, the way that... I made sure when we were still in the office that people knew I was a safe person to come to was by, I had rainbows all over my desk. Everything on my desk has rainbows. And I want people to know that I am that safe space and that if they need someone to talk to, I'm going to be, I, I'm going to keep that confidence and and that if they just have questions or they need to feel more comfortable about it, make yourself that safe person by just showing them that you support them without saying anything. You know, you a, a, inviting them, get, making friends, just like Eddie's saying, make friends with them, but you don't ever have to bring that up. When they're ready, they will. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, somehow, Amy, I don't think you're going to need the rainbow flags on your desk anymore for people to know <laughs> that you're a <laughs> that you're a safe space and that that you're you're someone that people can reach out to. So we're happy to kind of expand your your impact you. here and expand your horizons because you thank you. you all have I am a lot to offer. <laughs> I am always here. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, panelists. Th those are our audience questions. Um, that, that we received and we've covered a lot here today, right? Journeys and, and lessons. And, and I want to address, you know, a question that came up in the chat around kind of, and Amy mentioned the employee network group, our pride group, our inaugural, inaugural ENG. Um, part of our diversity, equity and inclusion program will include formalizing some of these employee network groups. A lot of our employee network groups are just grassroots efforts today to connect people around shared interests, but we're going to put a lot more investment and energy into our pride group and others and create an, an employee resource group for this, um, this community and make sure that we're really strengthening the connections and building a community across boundaries. Doesn't matter if you're in Raleigh or Salt Lake City or in Boca, we want you guys to be able to come together as a CHG community outside of location. Um, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, on the internet, there is an ENG page in sign up for Pride Today and you can at least get added to that distribution list, but there will be a lot more to come. Um, so panelists, um, I wanna just kind of give you guys an opportunity after we've covered a lot of information here, Anything you'd like to leave the audience with? Any last thoughts um, as we get close to the top of the hour that you'd like to share? I would like to just say to everyone that no matter what your identity is in any way, you're perfect exactly the way you are. And you don't, you don't need the justification or the acceptance of everyone to be the best person you can be. I needed that, Amy. Thank you. No, sorry. That, <laughs> that, that's a, that's very inspiring. I love that. Thank you, um, Steph. I think you you unmuted as well. Anything you'd like to share? 
I know, I'm wondering if that was a bad decision. Um, <laughs> I think any good meeting ends with people feeling motivated to go away from this and do something about what's been shared. And when I have people reach out to me like, what can I do to be a better ally? Um, I think what makes a really meaningful impact is to go and learn about these experiences and then speak up on behalf of this community. Whether you're a part of it or not, we need those voices. And I can tell you from personal experience, when I get on social media or something, there's a lot of you know, transphobic, homophobic things out there. And when I see friends and family who aren't part of this community speak up in defense of me, it brings me to tears. It means so much. And I think that's how we make things change. So I hope everybody feels a little more inspired to go do that. I have a feeling you got some some people in agreement with that, Stephanie. So uh, very well said. Thank you. Uh, Eddie, something you want to add? Yeah, well, it was more of a thank you to the DEI group um, for giving us this opportunity to really kind of share our stories and get the word out and let people know like you have friends and you have people who care about you. And regardless of what you're going through, like we will be there for you. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to Therese and uh, Christine for really putting this together and stuff. It was phenomenal and just proud to be a part of it. Oh, thank you, Eddie. I, I can't take any credit. This is all Sharice Jamison. So those of you that don't know Sharice, you will soon and, and your life will be forever brightened. So, <laughs> but thank you for that, Eddie. And again, that's a that's the reason we're doing this work. So much appreciated. Um, Bradley, what, what do you wanna leave people with today? So again, thank you to Sharice and yourself for, you know, um, and the company really as a whole for taking a stronger initiative and wanting to recognize that, um, you know, just like we did with the, you know, the different other, you know, the other panelists prior to this month, it's just, can't say enough about um, how proud I am of, uh, of working for this organization and what it's doing. Um, I was sharing with the panel when we were talking about this, my chorus is actually going through a very similar um, situation. I mean, it, the DEI in itself is in the chorus is happening just as much. So um, it's out there, it's real, it's hopefully um, broadening people's horizons and they're opening their minds to being able to just be loving and accepting of who we are. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, Bradley. And by the way, I've made a note that we got to get your chorus in one of these things somehow. I don't know how, but your chorus will be doing something at CHG. I'm just going to predict that, right? <laughs> hey, maybe our celebration. Sorry, Therese. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, such great, great insights um, from each of you today. I've personally learned a number of things and it just reinforces for me why this work matters why it's important to us as a company and why it's important to us as a society. So thank you for helping us educate ourselves and learn more about your community and, and your unique challenges. Um, and we're looking forward to supporting you. Um, all of you in the audience have received information, a toolkit at, on the internet that has a lot of great resources. So for those of you that want to continue your education, please take advantage of those resources that have been curated by our panelists and others today. Um, but what an inspiring session and um, it certainly kind of filled my tank a little bit. And so I'm grateful for each of you for sharing your stories. Um, and audience members, thank you so much for joining us today. It, we can't do this without you. So it is going to take all of us coming together to overcome some of the hate and, and vitriol that Bradley mentioned. Um, so we're, we're happy to have you with us on this journey. So, so that concludes our session for today. We hope to see all of you at the Pride celebration at the end of the month. Do not miss it. It will be amazing. So there will be more dancing like we did at the beginning of today's session. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience members. Happy Pride Month. And hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>